Joining me now are two of the co-founders of the Newark Water Coalition, Sabra B. and Anthony Diaz. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having us. You heard it there. Your fellow residents are pretty frustrated yeah. and angry about what happened. Um, you're a pretty new organization. Who wants to tell me how you all got funded? And was it only in the response to this particular crisis? Uh, Anthony. <laughs> all right. So it, we, you know, we've been friends for a long time. And we knew this issue was happening. And I remember having a conversation in Sabre's Kitchen about, hey, someone should really organize around this issue. And I was like, yeah, someone will organize around this issue. Apparently, no one was organizing around this issue. So we decided to take it up. And I put a call out, you know, you know, I've been an activist for a long time in the city of Newark. So I put a call out asking some friends to come and 30 people showed up and we were like, wow, people really care about this issue. And then we had another meeting and another 30 people showed up. And then that kind of got the ball rolling mm. in December of 2018. So people definitely cared. And there was a lot of community, you know, saying, hey, we need to rally around this. We need the facts. We need the information. I should say it's Sabre, it's Saber, not Sabra. It's Saber. Like Saber. Saber to Tiger. Saber. <laughs> it's a good one. Saber B. <laughs> um, what is the situation? How are people dealing with the water crisis? What are you drinking? What's actually the condition on the ground? So as of right now, there are ev this evidence of lead contamination in all of the wards in Newark, right? So what people have been doing is they've been doing point of use filters, and those are kind of like the pure filters that you see attached to the faucet. Uh, people have been using pitchers that they can drain the water into so that it filters through. Um, what we advocate for is point of entry filters, right? Because then it eliminates that huge margin of error mm. that you have at the sink. Maybe you're not a plumber, right? Maybe you're not putting on correctly. Maybe you're not using it properly. Like you're not supposed to put hot water through it. You know, so there's a lot of things that if you're not in the conscious mind to keep it maintained, you can still be exposing yourself and your family to life. Also, those commercial filters that people may have seen, they're not cheap. They're no. not cheap. And you have to replace them regularly? Yes. And when you have a lead situation, it it speeds up the amount of time that it takes for the filter to die on you. Mm. So if it's supposed to be maybe three months, maybe you'll get a month and a half out of it, you know? And has there been adequate surveying of local people, particularly kids? Mm. We did a story in um, Baltimore after the death of Freddie Gray, mm. who himself had suffered from lead poisoning. And we looked into the implications lifelong for people who have been in a lead poisoning situation, dropping out of school, finding learning hard, often running into trouble with the cops, in Freddie's case, turning up, ending up dead. And that's one of the things that we like to talk about because everybody's talking about replacing these lead service lines to avoid this poisoning, but the damage has been done. Has this, it? We've already been living like this for two and a half years, almost three years. So we, we, we're very conscious of that. We're conscious of the treatment, of the implications. We know there's a correlation between aggression and lead poisoning. And then when you look at this, uh, like a city like Newark that has a high level of crime, a high level of unemployment, you start to wonder, you know, how far does this well go down? Mm. How far is this connection? And it makes us very sad. And so one of the things that we've been lobbying for, at least with some legislators, is, hey, there needs to be a treatment plan in place. There needs to be wraparound service around this because we know that we've been living like this for, for over more than a year. So, so is there what's coming out of city government in terms of rep reparation, repair? So, so far what we've heard is that short term, People will be able to get filters, people will be able to get bottled water, people will be able to get pitchers if they need it, they'll be able to get their homes tested for lead, their bodies tested for lead. Uh, and then just recently they said that they, meaning the administration, uh, Ras Baraka, they're going to allocate $120 million of a loaned amount to the city to replace the lead service lines. So the idea is invest in infrastructure, get infrastructure done, but as Anthony was saying, what about the very human price of this. We know directly people whose children have lead poisoning and it has completely yeah. devastated their development. And just to be clear, I'm not an expert on this, but before people get devastated watching this, <laughs> you can remediate both the water and your own blood system. Damage can get done, but it doesn't have to be severe. It doesn't have to be imperiling for your whole future if you intervene early enough, right? If you intervene early enough, yes. Unfortunately, there's no real reverse for lead poisoning. And that's part of the issue as well because, you know, we're getting a lot of miscommunication from the city administration. So people, they don't have all the facts. And so because they don't have all the facts, they can't, you know, they can't protect themselves. 
So I think that's one of the biggest issues as well. You know, a lot of misinformation, a lot of the resources not making it to the hands of the affected people. And it's a real problem. So we've been trying to really mobilize efforts to canvas the communities, provide education. You know, the elderly population still boils their water. And that's one of the worst things that you can do, especially in a lead situation. So it's just getting the information out is one but of I would boil my water, you're not supposed to? No. It concentrates the metals when you boil it. So it might help for other things, you know, like other contaminants to boil it out, but not lead specifically. It just goes to the question of information. I mean, right. before we move on, I just need to say there's a race piece of all of this, or we should say racism piece of all of this. Um, do you want to talk to that for a minute? Oh, definitely. We were on a panel the other night and we were hearing about the situation in Detroit where 140,000 homes have been shut off with water. And the person was talking about, well, Detroit has this comeback city narrative. And we were talking, hey, Newark has the same narrative. So it's like you see, you know, in the outskirts of the city, in the low income areas of the city, you have this problem. But in the heart of the downtown area, you don't have a lead crisis. You walk around and it seems business as, as normal. A luxury apartment was tested within 24 hours once they got scared. But then you see, you know, public housing authority officials will not test those buildings. And you see like this definitely discrimination against the, the lower class. And it's, it's just, it hurts, it hurts. And an even more blatant example of that, I think, is during the VMAs, the VMAs were in Newark this year, uh, we have a lead crisis. The mayor had not put out information calling it a crisis until kind of that day of the VMAs and the day before when he said, hey, people who are coming here, we have this issue, but don't worry. The water at the Prudential Center and the water at the surrounding businesses will be fine. So if you are there for the Video Music Awards, don't worry. Yes. yes. Don't need to feel any kinship with the people. Don't feel like any them. kinship. <laughs> and plus, the water that you're drinking will be filtered. So I'm not certain if they went in and did a quick fix job and did all the businesses in the area or what, but that was just a real... It's it a slap was, in the face. a real slap in the face. Raz Baraka has come in for a lot of grief. <laughs> On this program, we try to look at structural challenges more than individuals. But how are you looking at him? And what does he need to do to turn this around? For me, it was always been a thing of accountability, right? We know that this issue did not start with his administration, but hey, the problem is here now. Own it, own the problem. You're a leader, you're supposed to provide for your people. And we haven't seen that. We haven't seen the transparency around it. We've had problems with each of the programs, you know, the filter program. You know, I would qualify for a filter, but say Saber is my neighbor, she wouldn't qualify for a filter. Or if I qualify for a filter, I should qualify for water, but then we don't get cases of water. So there's holes in all the programs and especially education. We talked about the misinformation before. So if you're the boss, you're in charge of this effort and there's holes along the way, how can I trust you to do the lead service line program? How can I have confidence in you when you didn't speak to this two years prior? How can I have confidence in you when you didn't talk about this during the election, when it was a very real issue and a very real problem? So for him personally, I think there's a lot of flaws there. And again, this is your team. Your team is not doing the best it can for its residents. So we have a lot of issues there. And you know, it, we're willing to work with anyone, right? We've asked him for a meeting, you know, we've been ignored for a week or two weeks going on now. But we just wanted solutions. We want to get this problem solved. It's not about us, it's not about him, it's just about helping the kids who are affected. And, and Cor- that's what we care about. And your former mayor, Cory Booker, is out there on the campaign trail. Yeah. What use is he making of his now national megaphone? Uh, <laughs> so fortunately, um, we were able to get a meeting with his team, not with him personally, uh, but he says that he's on it, right? He says that he, this, this matters to him. You know, he was a former mayor. He kind of legged up on Newark to get to the Senate and then is continuing his way. We just ask him that he mentions it, right? If you're on a national stage and you mention it, people listen to you, you know? And so that's kind of what we, the call is and we'll see what happens. And we still listen, we still got our ear. We are <laughs> still <laughs> very hopeful here. that he will say something, you, you know? You gotta keep that optimism yeah. You gotta going. keep that optimism. <laughs> The other issue that has come up in our conversations with people in Newark is this question of privatization. Oh. And I'd like to you to take a listen to, take a look at what people are saying around this question. Here's up from our reporting in Newark this September. What is this right now? Is this what they, what, what they would normally use to say, let's privatize water? Is this what you normally see like your organization? Yeah, I mean, we saw a clear example of that very strategy 
in the wake of the Newark life crisis, we have a very powerful state senator, Senator Paul Sarlo, uh, representing sections of North Jersey, uh, published an op-ed in the Star Ledger, the largest paper in New Jersey, calling for the city of Newark to privatize their water system, specifically citing the lead crisis. Wow. So uh, we, we definitely see that both corporations and their political allies try to take advantage of communities that were facing these 